continue with this, with phrase structure and then uh, we will look at how those nodes are related to one another and what else we need, we understand through phrase structure, how, how that whole uh, understanding of internal structure of language becomes helpful in understanding further relationship between several components. What, what have we seen so far with the help of phrase structure? Anybody? If we, if we look at, if we look at the distinction between subject and a predicate with respect to phrase structure, what do we get? What do we see? What is the distinction between a subject and a predicate with respect to phrase structure? Right. So, we understand the constraints or requirements of proximity or distance between components of a sentence, right. Phrase structure clearly tells us that subject is completely outside uh, it, and the whole notion of subject becomes clearer looking at phrase, phrase structure, okay. So, so far we can say a, a subject is the noun that app occurs in the that occurs in the specifier position of an IP, okay. But that does not that does not define subject properly. The question still remains what is the NP, what is the noun that goes in the specifier of this of the subject position, how do we know about about it? The current discussion on structural relations and their cases is going to help us understand the notion of subject and the components of predicates in a better way. Before that, uh, I want you to understand agreement patterns. There are two types of agreement patterns and both the types become help the our understanding of relationship between a head and its a specifier and the relationship between a head and its complement uh, help us understand the uh, understand two different types of agreement patterns so let me let me show you what i mean by what i mean by that see uh, here is a here is the structure of a phrase by now we have seen that this is the head position this is in a specifier position and this is a complement position. Depending upon the nature of a phrase, different kinds of element go in the specifier position or in the complement position. However, what remains in the head position is the head lexical category of this phrase in this case. there is a specific relationship between these two. This is called spec head relation, that is what you see uh, on the screen. It describes one type of agreement patterns and then the second one is called head complement relations. One is hierarchical, that is a spec head is hierarchical, where a spec is higher than the head and head and comp is parallel at, at equal level, right. So, these are the, with this differences they capture certain kind of agreement patterns. For example, look at the look at the first one in the as a noun phrase and I, I do not think it is important to draw or please let me know if you think it is important to draw, I will draw this and show it to you. When we say this book, right. We, we see that the demonstrative pronoun this is here and then we have a head book, clear? There is a relationship between these two. 
when we need to say these books, we, we, do, we do not say these book or we do not say this books. Clear? Now, the, the two elements the, this and these, they occur in their specifier position and then they control the relationship between relations, they, they have a special relationship with its head. That is they are governed, they are, they are totally in accordance with its head. This kind of relationship can only be captured through some sort of understanding between spec and its head. And then we need to figure out, so, so one way is to describe, I, this, this is what we see. Uh, in, in understanding linguistic structure, description is something that we see. Explanation is something that we do not see, which in this case it would mean that this is visible, we see that. But are there constraints on this? How do we capture those constraints? What, what, what are the underlying principles governing such constraints is what I am going to discuss with you. Then you see another uh, type of uh, agreement pattern in languages, which is about uh, comp and head. So, if we have a phrase like in this case, we have a choti gadi, right? Uh, it is a Hindi word which means a small car. What type of a phrase is this? Adjective, adjective phrase, right? And what is in that, what is, what will be in the head position of that adjective phrase? Sorry, choti. Choti. The adjective in this phrase is choti or in the other phrase is uh, bada or something, right. We, I, I, I hope everybody understands this much of Hindi and you can, you can see the point that I am trying to make. The adjective choti agrees with the noun, with, with the noun, okay. And then likewise, the adjective bade agrees with the noun as well. What is the, how do they agree? What is, what do we mean here when we say they agree with each other? Case choti is feminine, sir. The car is also feminine. So, feminine in Hindi. so they should be in agreement. To so, the ka choti and no, car no, agree. Car. We cannot this say chota car. That is feminine, right? Car. Okay. So, they agree with, with one another in terms of gender. And then the second one? Quality. Number. Number. Number and gender both. Right? So, this kind of agreement, if you see, we have a head position and a comp position, uh, okay. So, this agreement is called head and complement relationship, right. Because both are at different levels, one is hierarchical and the other is not there has to be something going on in the, in how these agreements are maintained, okay. Uh, also, one of the differences that I want to draw your attention to is when we say this book about linguistics, that is when a specifier, a specifier is in agreement with its head right. It is in agreement with the head, but then at the same time a specifier is related to the entire phrase. That is the rest of the phrase is in domain of that specifier. However, with the complement head relationship, only head makes sure that the complement and the relationship that, that is agreement with, with the comp is taken care of and then it does not spill over other, other kinds of elements, okay. All right. So, this is one, this is one, these are the two patterns that I wanted you to keep in mind before we discuss more things. Now, uh, there are a couple of terms that I want you to know uh, before we talk about more terms. Uh, the first is dominance, okay. Uh, what do you see here? The definition of dominance. Uh, can somebody read this 
loudly. And if there is a line tracing A to B going downward. Okay. So you you understand this definition? Node A dominates node B if and only if these two conditions meet. Right? Now, given that definition, what are the nodes which are dominating nodes in this phrase? The small one. Uh, specifier dominates what? Noun and complement both. No. N dash no. dominates N and complement. No, it does not. It is higher up so in the tree, it is higher, right? It dominates only book. Look at this. Look, look, at, look at the definition and the structure carefully. I, I understand that the word dominance is not a difficult thing to understand, but still I am putting up this definition and structure both for you to see there is a reason behind this. Noun phrase, this note dominates this one. Does it dominate this one too? How about these ones? Does this one dominate this? There is a line joining. There is a line joining them. So, NP being the highest node dominates everything else because there is a line joining everything. Even this one is dominated by NP. Of course, there are other elements dominating them. So, the way we, we describe this is NP is going to be dominating spec and N bar and it is also going to be dominating N and its complement. However, N bar is, if, if we are talking about nodes dominating N, are you with me? Nodes dominating N, what are the nodes that are dominating N? N bar and NP. So, is it, it is fair only that we say NP dominates N, however, N bar immediately dominates N. Yes, that that is the, that is one of the things we want to capture through this defini definition of dominance. Clear. Spec does not dominate uh, n bar or n and it is more than obvious that n does not dominate a spec at all. That that is even intuitive, but so being higher up in the structure or a structural hierarchy means that the node that is lower is not going to be dominating the other. And there is a meaning of, there is a meaning associated with this dominance when a node dominates the other, other one, uh, the generic or intuitive meaning is that everything else is in the scope of that node. Okay? Everything else is under influence of that node. I am using generic terminology before I reach to the technical ones. Okay? However, they do not work the other way around. Okay? If we are looking at a flat structure of a sentence and if I just write to you this book of, this book of linguistics, it is hard to explain how this and book are in hierarchical relationships, how this takes both book and linguistics, book and of linguistics in its, uh, in its uh, scope. Okay? So, uh, uh, hierarchical structure this describing relationship between different nodes and different components help us understand these things. Now, precedence should be simple again. Is it clear, intuitive? Please tell me which one, which one precedes. Uh, uh, does this spec precede anything? No. This precedes n n bar. Can we say spec precedes n too, given this definition? It does. 
clearly if, if we are talking about a spec, let us say A and we, this is B, right? A is to the left of B and A does not dominate B and B does not dominate A at all. Therefore, A precedes B, okay? And a, te, and a, and a clear canonical example of precedence is this one. None of the two, A and B, dominate each other and A is on the other side, on the left side of B. Any difficulty? So, so complement uh, is also preceded by uh, specifier. Com, a spec precedes com, can we say that? Tell me. Yeah, now, yes. yes. Spec precedes all the other elements. Spec precedes all the elements. In yes. Expect except NP, yes, which is the, the relationship between a spec of a phrase and the phrase itself cannot be of precedence. It, it has to be defined only with dominance, whereas, go ahead. If the relation is not dominance, then it is precedence, right? No. If the relationship is not domi of dominance, then it has to be described in terms of precedence, yes. Now, the whole, the, the <coughs> terms of dominance and precedence, how are they going to be relevant in capturing further details? Let us look at some of them. But before that, I guess I have something else to tell you, which is now we are getting into uh, uh, an understanding of case, right? Uh, it is an, it's an abstract term, it is an abstract entity case, uh, not it, we do not understand much if we just mention case. We understand case relationship better when we describe these things in their structural configurations. And we also see the significance of why we need to understand case relationship among nouns, nouns only when we look at a structure, okay. See, uh, to, to give you, there, are, there could be two types of cases in natural languages. One could be morphological and the other abstract. Does this make sense, morphological case and abstract case? If they do not, hold on. Look at, let us look at the examples and they will make sense. They are, they are simple terms. Uh, and I, I have tried to put uh, the relevant, uh, term, relevant uh, uh, parts in color. When we say uh, John is from Germany, <coughs> does this word show you any case? D do you realize that there is any case on that? Do you see anything on this? No, right? When we say his coat is big, okay, this word is different, his, okay. Mary is his friend, right? This word, uh, Mary you do not see anything happening to Mary, but you, you see something happening to his. When I am saying something happening to his, what I mean is it is not he anymore, okay? Uh, he likes her. If, can we say Mary is he friend? No? Why not? Why do we need to say Mary is his friend? What goes, something goes wrong, right? When we say Mary is he friend, right? Can we say instead of he likes her, can we say he likes she? No. Something, something wrong with that, with that sentence. Of course, that wrong is the sentence becomes ungrammatical. But we need to know when we say he likes she, what causes that ungrammaticality? She is a good word in English, right? He is a good word in English otherwise. But when they appear in a particular position in a sentence, they are, they are forcing this, un forcing ungrammaticality on sentences, right? So, for this, uh, for now, the point that I am trying to, to tell you here is, 
words like uh, Mary, John, he, she, the, in, these, in these words you do not see any change in the word. And even though they carry certain cases, they are, they are examples of abstract cases. And when you see an obvious change in the word, then they are because of some kind of prefix, suffix or, or something. When, when a change becomes visible, visible, we call that morphological change. Therefore, if you see a change in the word because of case, that is because that is a, an example of realization of a morphological case. And when we do not see, then it is an example of abstract case. Whether morphological or abstract, a noun once used in a sentence must have a case. The better way to put it will be a noun phrase once used in a sentence must have a case. A noun phrase which does not receive a case yields ungrammaticality. And case is relevant not to noun phrases case is relevant to the place, to the position in the sentence. When we put certain, certain nouns uh, which uh, do not conform to that position, then the sentence become ungrammatical. In this, like, like I gave you the example, we cannot say he likes she, because that is the position in which you get a different case and she has a different case. Therefore mismatch of cases results into ungrammaticality. It is making sense about morphological and abstract case. That is all we need to understand from here. We, need, we are going to look at some of the things again. So, let us look at this. Visible? Okay. Uh, uh, I, I, I think it is self-explanatory. However, what I want to tell you is we do not see, we do not see any kind of morphological markers on lexical NPs, that is word, words denoting names like John or Mary or anything, at least in terms of nominative and accusative cases. I am going to be talking about in particular two, two cases, nominative and accusative. I have mentioned genitive because it is easy to see and you will, you will be able to understand. Genitive is not the case which I will be discussing when we look at uh, structural configurations. So, and, and I have also not put uh, first person, second person or anything. When we look at pronominal NPs, then cases become visible and they are more of morphological type. They change the shape of the NP. Morphological cases change the shape of those NPs. So, when uh, Words like me, him, her, them, us, these are loaded with cases. Okay? And uh, they appear in places where we have accusative cases, places which are relevant for accusative cases and in, the, in such cases, they cannot appear in their nominative forms. Very briefly here, uh, if I talk about number and person, uh, I, everybody knows that it is first person, you, you, second person, second person and he, she, she third, person. third person. I, singular, plural will be, we, you, singular or plural, both. Okay. And in the plural form, you, what you are saying by both is in the plural form also we do not see any, anything changing. That is little bit tricky. Okay? Well, hold on, let me, let me come to that in a moment. Uh, uh, we, singular or plural? We, plural. Uh, they, plural. Okay. Now, very briefly about you. Uh, if, so say it again, you is singular or plural? Both. So, when we say both, then we are saying it could be singular as well. Right? Give me an example 
of a sentence where we, where we use this pronoun you with a singular verb. So what is the verb in this case? Everybody paying attention to this? What is the verb in this case? It is no verb actually. Okay. What is indicating agreement? R. Is that singular or plural? Plural. So then how is it singular? Can we, can we ever say you is my friend? No. Meaning singular. And when I say you are my friend, how do I not, how am I not referring to more than one person? My friend. So that is all friend. right, but there could be more than one person my friend. If I say you are my friend, how am I not referring to more than one person? I only want you to see the complexity, that is it. You do not have to have an answer and this is not your fault or my fault. This is how English is structured. So can we say you is singular? One single ins example where this pronoun, simple pronoun that we all know since long time, kindergarten, you can show me in agreement with anything else in terms of singular. And I can show you grammar books after grammar books indicating you both as singular and plural. I am doing the same thing here too. Just, just because I am copying it from some, some place to show you that I is singular and we is plural and you in one case is singular and in the other case is plural. Okay? However, it is important to keep in mind that you is never ever singular. What it does is the whole plural agreement is ambiguous in terms of its, their numbers. Sometimes they do refer to one person only and that this is where uh, cognitive computation of human mind comes into. Human, the, the computation of human mind makes no mistakes. You say you are my friend. The, the listener's mind or the speaker's mind makes no mistake in the interpretation whether it is being referred to as singular or plural. Without us overtly knowing that you can never be singular. Clear? All right. So that, that, that is an issue for some other time. With, with this picture, what you see is demonstration of morphological cases becoming visible only when we are talking about pronominal NPs. In, in uh, lexical NPs, the distinction between nominative case and accusative case is not morphological, it is abstract. Okay? Now, the two more terms that I am going to be using, one is finiteness and the other is infiniteness or non-finiteness. Okay? They simply refer to tenses. When we say finite sentence or a finite clause, we mean a sentence with which has got tense. And when we say non-finite, we mean when, the ten, when there is no tense. And where does the tense occur in the structure? Where does the tense occur in the structure of a sentence? Difficult? If we are talking about a sentence and the structure of a whole sentence, where does the tense occur in that? Where do we put tense? Complement? Okay. Uh, hold on. Uh, I, I want to talk about a very simple sentence again. Where do we put the tense in this structure? I. So, here, what is the tense in this sentence? John likes Mary. Present. The name is present, but it is plus tense. So, in that is what makes this whole sentence 
finite and there are going to be sentences where we do not have tenses. Okay. Uh, I will discuss that with you in a moment. Now, if you look at the, these two sentences, first two sentences, John likes Mary and John likes her, in both the sentences, John is the subject of the sentence. It comes from it comes from the understanding of a structure of a sentence that subject is going to occur in the specifier position of a sentence. However, the other important point describing or explaining subject is it must have nominative case all the time. An NP in a nominative case can only be the subject of a sentence. When we are talking about two cases, nominative and accusative cases, an NP in anything other than nominative case cannot be the subject. Okay? Uh, and therefore, a nominative NP occurs only in a finite sentence. Okay? Uh, however, accusative cases are for objects of verbs and for the objects of uh, prepositions that I am that I am going to show you. Is the, is the distinction between finiteness and non-finiteness clear to you? People from this side. Okay. Now, uh, I want to talk about one example of non-finite finite clause. You see, the example that I have given you given you here for him to go to Delhi is not possible. Is the whole whole sentence is not non-finite. The whole sentence is a finite thing, that is finite, finite clause, a finite sentence. What is the tense in that sentence? For him to go to Delhi is not possible. What is the tense of this sentence? Present tense. Present tense. How do we know that? Is. Now, for him to go to Delhi, what is that, what is that whole, whole chunk of this sentence? What is the role of that whole chunk in this sentence? These are simple sentences, we speak these kinds of sentences every day, every day. We write these sentences every day. Do you see this? Now, be, be, before you tell me anything about that, this whole chunk by itself looks like a sentence. Does it have a verb in it? Does it have a verb in it? The verb is go. go. Now, the verb is the, di the difference between a fini finite sentence and this one is there is a verb, but that verb is non-finite. That verb in this small clause that you see in red on the screen does not have a tense in it. Okay, does not have a tense in it. Therefore, this clause is called non-finite clause. Okay? Now, for, for this non-finite clause, there is a there is a NP in this before go. What is the NP? Uh, which is the pronominal NP, which is him, but that is not in the nominative case, because nominative case marked NPs cannot be part of a non-finite clause. That is the point I am trying to show you. Nominative case marked NPs cannot be part of a non-finite clause and non-finite clause, there is another restriction on non-finite clauses is non-finite cl clauses are not independent clauses. Okay? Uh, let me give you one more example of a non-finite uh, and, and a finite clause. By now you uh, must have developed a fairly good understanding that every sentence must have a subject. Okay? Every sentence must have a subject. I am giving you a very simple sentence. I want to go. Is this a simple sentence? Right? How many verbs are there in this sentence? How many verbs are there in this sentence? You, 
when I look at you, it, it feels to me like I am asking very complicated questions. Two verbs, they are? Want and go. Which verb do you think is finite and which is non-finite? Want is finite and to go is non-finite. Now, the moment we are talking about a non-finite clause, non-finite clause may not have it have tense. This is what after all makes it non-finite. But the moment we talk about a clause, it must have a subject. Okay? What's the, do you see any subject here in the sentence, I want to, we have a sentence, I want to go. In this sentence, we have a small non-finite non clause, which is to go. Do you see any subject of that, that clause? No? I will be the subject of that clause. They think just little bit harder. They are, they are very simple sentences, but actually they are not. So, if I, if we are, if we are talking about I being the subject of that non-finite clause, then how is that sentence supposed to sound? Nobody says it that way, but tell me, how is that suppo sentence supposed to sound? I want, that is fine, I, this is how we say, but if I becomes the subject of the non-finite clause also, then how is that sentence supposed to sound? Which nobody says, but can you say that for me? I want I to go. Understand? Get, get this? I want I to go. Now, what does the second I refer to? Same person. Therefore, this is deleted. Now, look at this. Therefore, this is deleted. An identical item in the sentence gets deleted because languages tend to follow principle of economy. Anything that becomes redundant, language does not tolerate it, which becomes the characteristics of human mind as well, that human mind would not allow redundancies. Okay? Now, however, even though deleted, this empty position remains active. This empty position remains active because like these, you can have different sentences you can have a different uh, subject in that position. right? Can I say, I want you to go? I can also say, I want him to go, her to go, them to go. Get this thing? That position is active. However, it gets deleted only in the cases when there is an identical subject of the main class. See this thing? Now, I am, on, I am not only trying to show you magic or, or uh, uh, some of the simple, some of the facts about simple sentences that are not usually visible or we do not pay much attention to those when we are speaking the language or when we have learned the language. The, the things that I want to draw your attention to is every sentence, whether finite or non-finite, must have a subject. The, when we say must have a subject, this requirement may not show up, may not force a noun phrase to occur overtly. They can remain covert as well, which means the position remains active. Now, second part is uh, non-finite clauses do not occur independently, which becomes a huge restriction on the sentence that when we want to have a sentence, that sentence may have five other non-finite clauses, but must have at least one finite clause. And the moment we have one finite clause, we, that defines the whole, whole uh, sentence. We may have more than one non-finite clause. We may have more than one finite clause also within a sentence, but there must be at least one finite clause to define a sentence. Okay? And then you, we may have more than one non-finite clauses as well finiteness or non-finiteness, irrespective of that, there must be a subject. And when we have subjects in different positions, subjects and objects in different positions, they must have cases. Subjects are always going to have nominative cases and objects will be, will have accusative case or some people call the same thing as 
uh, accusative case or objective case. It really does not change anything. Get it? Now, any questions so far? Anything which is not clear from what I have said so far? Clear? Okay. Then let us move to the next thing. Now, we are getting into the areas where we want to know how does, how do these NPs get subjects, get, get uh, cases. Now, let us look at this first. Uh, uh, this is the, is this the object position in this sentence? Is this the object position? This is a, uh, this is an NP which is at the complement position, but what is the relationship of this NP with the verb? This verb, this NP is the, is of course, the complement of this, this verb which is a transitive verb, but this is also the object of this verb. In other words, this is one argument of this, this verb. This position is accusative position that is objective position. Now, NPs when they are independent of this sentence do not have any cases of their own. Please, please note this distinction. NPs in independent world as a vocabulary list do not have cases of their own. When we are talking about nominative and accusative, we are talking about these two cases in a structural relationship. They receive accusative case when they land in this position. Okay? So, Mary receives accusative case in this position and in this case because it is a lexical NP, it is not visible and therefore, it is an, it is an example of an abstract case. However, if you put a pronominal NP here, then it is going to be visible which will be her and we cannot put she because she is an example of nominative case marked pronominal NP and that cannot appear in this position. That much we have seen. The way, the, the way structure, dominance, precedence and other things that we have seen helps us understand when the, when the case is related to a position, it is said that this is a head position. Remember this? And heads in, ling, in phrase structure, heads in phrase structures have cases to dispense with. That is, heads assign cases to their complements. In other words, we, I mean we can say the same thing in different, different words. For a complement to be warranted with the head, it must have a relationship. That is, this head assigns accusative case to this NP. What will be the condition for this assignment? Verbs and post positions are clear heads. I am not talking about nominative case right now. Uh, we are running out of time. We will talk about nominative case assignment uh, uh, tomorrow, but I do want to conclude it with the accusative case assignment. There are two things that you will see always. Uh, uh, verbs, okay, let me put it this way. Every phrase has a head, right? Even NP has an head which is N, but N is not a case assigner. The case assigning heads in phrase structure are V and P, that is verbs and prepositions only and they are called, because they are heads, because they assign cases, they are also called governors. Okay? Uh, it is said that this assignment of accusative case works under the notion of what we know as C command. Okay? And which reads as, uh, this is a simple definition of a C command, can somebody read this for me? <coughs> A does not dominate B, 
Okay. So in this case, right, what is the, if, if we are talking about A, this, if we are talking about A and B, right, so does A dominate B, does B dominate A, no, what is the first branching node dominating both, VP, okay. This is a simple, de simple definition of C command, which means A, we can say A C commands B. Can we say that? A C commands B. This definition has a problem. Can node uh, B C commands node A, we can also say that. That is the problem. With this definition, what we, the, the problem that we get into is B C commands A too. Okay. In and and why will that be a problem for us? Because if we say A A assigns case to B because A C commands B, then we land into difficulty. Why would B not C command? Why would B not assign anything to A because B C commands A too? So this definition has to be a little bit more restrictive. Now. If you look at the notion of government, of course heads are governor, governors, but uh, again we have the similar kind of a problem with this. Get, get, the, get the problem? Understand the problem that, that it is creating for us? Okay. Now, uh, a more restrictive definition of a C command will be, what, what, what are we trying to do before we understand this? When we say more restrictive definition of C command, what are we trying to do? <coughs> that the governor can only C command B, that is only A should C command B, not B, B should be in a position to C command A and that we need to restrict. This, please tell me if this restricts that. Look at this and see if it, see the, if they get restricted. A C commands B if and only if A does not dominate B and every X that dominates A also dominates B. X is, where X is the first branching node. Get it? See, uh, th there is one more thing about this that I need to tell you because we, with this definition we need to define first branching node. What do we mean by first branching node? Uh, A, uh, okay, one more thing we want to restrict is we do not want to say, according to the previous definition that I gave you, this one C commands this two. Right? The, this one C commands this too, but we do not want to say that this assigns case to this or does something to this NP. So we need to define first branching node in terms of a maximal projection and the examples of maximal projections are NP, VP, PP, right, AP. So when we say X is the first branching node, we want to define X branch X as the maximal project, where X is a maximal projection, okay? And then we will be able to restrict the fact that only A should be C commanding B and then we can say A C commands B, A governs B, therefore A assigns accusative case to NP, to the NP that is in its domain. I see some No, not clear. So what's what is the problem part? The difference between the previous thing and this thing, it's, it's both. In the so we can replace A by B in this case and B by A. So again, there is no difference. <coughs> no. Look at the look at the further one M command. Oh, 
okay. If it does not show you the difference, let me tell you the idea at least. Okay. This shows the difference, I will talk about this again. Let me show you, the, let me tell you the idea. The main point is we want to devise a mechanism through which we can only, we, we, the system should only allow A to see command B and not B to see command A. Think, think about this thing little, little, little bit. You, do you have an access to books now, right? The PDF copies of the books, did you, did you get a copy of that? All these things are explained with good examples in great details. Please take a look at this and I will try to clarify this C command and M command business little bit more when we are talking about assignment of nominative cases to, to the NP. Hold on, can I, can I get your attention for another 30 seconds? We are saying in this case that V as a governor assigns accusative case to, to its complement NP, right. What will be the governor? Do you, know, you know now where the subject NP occurs. Subject NP occurs in which position? Subject NP occurs in which position? Head position. Spec position of IP. What will assign nominative case? Which, what will be the head that will give nominative case to the spec NP? Spec of IP, okay, is the question that we will discuss and then you will be able to see the relevance of C command and M command in more details. Let me stop this. Okay. Thank you.